from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. Welcome to the legislature today from the state capitol building in Charleston. As lawmakers readied themselves last night to complete action on a bill calling for pay raises for teachers, school service personnel, and state police, Governor Jim Justice released a statement criticizing state leaders of teachers unions, as well as Democrats for grandstanding in an election year. Dave Mistich has reaction to the passage of the bill the night before the scheduled work stoppage is to begin. Senate Bill 267, now awaiting the governor's signature, calls for a 2% increase this year for teachers, with an additional 1% increase the following two years. American Federation of Teachers West Virginia President Christine Campbell says the current version of the bill isn't enough to satisfy their demands and prevent a walkout. Last year we had a $500 million uh, hole in the budget and the governor proposed a 2% pay raise in those dire economic times. We come back this year and everything's supposed to be better and we know that we're turning a corner according to the governor's statements, but he proposes a 1% this year. So yes, is it refreshing to talk about salaries? Absolutely. Is it refreshing to talk about salaries going back down from the proposed 5%? to now 4%? Absolutely not. The Senate's original proposal called for a 1% increase each year for five years. While the House passed a bill with a 2% increase this year, with 1% hikes the following three years. After Senate Bill 267 was hung up in the Senate Rules Committee, an amendment dropping 1% from the House version was adopted, and the bill was fast-tracked across the rotunda all the way to passage. Another concern for teachers has been the rising cost of their health care. The Public Employees Insurance Agency Finance Board agreed yesterday to freeze proposed changes to the plan that would increase costs. That's only because of a one-time transfer of funds from the state's rainy day account, making that freeze just that, temporary. Multifaceted long-term solutions have been proposed, such as placing funds from general revenue surpluses and sports betting revenues towards the PEIA Stability Fund. But West Virginia Education Association President Dale Lee notes that those bills are still working their way through the legislative process and aren't guaranteed. There's two funding source bills out there, but they're both speculative bills. You don't know what excess uh, surplus your state's going to have, so you really can't rely on 20% on of a surplus that may be zero. 20% of zero is still zero. And the sports betting bill, First of all, you don't know if the Supreme Court's going to approve that or not. And secondly, you don't know how, actually how much money that's going to bring in. So funding it with, with sources that, that are not concrete is not the solution to this problem. As the two-day statewide walkout looms, Senate President Mitch Carmichael says teachers should be satisfied with the efforts from the legislature, especially considering that the economic outlook of the state is just now improving. He also warns of possible consequences of walking off the job. It's an illegal work stoppage. Uh, it doesn't change you know, what we can afford, uh, the people of West Virginia. We've pledged, we've uh, demonstrated the ability to, uh, to provide pay raises, to freeze benefits, to uh, do all those wonderful things that we're able to do. Uh, and for someone to walk out after that uh, effort and benefit and investment is just very disappointing. With long-term solutions for PEIA still up in the air and the teacher pay raise bill having been cut down from earlier proposals in both the House and Senate, Lee and Campbell say the Thursday and Friday work stoppage is still on. Moving forward, many Democrats say the events of the past couple days may incite more frustrations. 
Delegate Mike Caputo says the vote last night to pass the teacher pay raise bill has fanned that fire. I think it infuriates them, and could it extend the work stoppage? I think the, the vote uh, that was cast by those House members last night to accept this uh, for the Republican majority to ram this through at, what, 8.30 late last night, I think they, they're the ones that determined there was going to be a walkout, and I think it could be, uh, you know, could even be longer. Campbell and Lee say they plan to meet with those on the local level after Friday to determine whether to continue the work stoppage past the weekend. For the legislature today, I'm Dave Mistich at the Capitol. Hundreds gathered for an energy jobs rally here at the Capitol today, so we invited Senator Randy Smith, chair of the Energy, Industry and Mining Committee, to join us this evening to discuss several bills under consideration. Senator Smith, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me here. So as we've said, there was a sizable energy jobs rally here today. Just kind of walk us through how big of a role this in, this industry has played in the last year with shoring up general revenue and just briefly, what kind of expansion do you see? Well, I think it's no uh, secret that severance tax from coal and gas is two of the main reasons that we've been able to climb out of this hole that uh, we was in for the last uh, several years uh, with the increase of uh, coal severance tax and increase in gas average tax. So it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a huge, uh, uh, had a huge effect on our budget this year. And uh, going forward uh, with the expansion of, of the gas industry and ho hopefully the uh, stabilizing coal industry for right now, you know, the, it gives West Virginia a brighter future because we are a natural resource state. You know, we depend a lot on uh, our natural resources, coal, gas, oil, and uh, so it's, it's going to be a huge impact going forward. Yeah, and I know um, last month our revenue estimates ran short, and I know severance tax did have a role to play in that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know a lot of it is uh, business climate, you know what I mean? Uh, we're, uh, you know, we're one of the few states that has a coal severance tax, and uh, we have one of the highest gas severance uh, tax of, you know, any gas producing state. So, uh, you know, our surrounding uh, states like uh, Pennsylvania has no severance tax on gas and uh, Ohio is like, uh, what is it, three, three cents per thousand or 10,000, I can't remember right off, but uh, it's really minute and ours is 5%. So uh, I believe that, you know, you see more activity in Pennsylvania and Ohio because it's more profitable. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying we should give away the farm, but, you know, we need to find ways to be, uh, you know, more business friendly and, and uh, attract, you know, the, uh, the drilling in our areas and the state. Yeah. And we've heard from viewers, and there's been testimony at the co tenancy public hearing that these jobs aren't going to West Virginians. Crews are being brought in for these jobs, and that there's nothing in the legislation yet that says West Virginians should have preference in the hiring process, at, at least to set a quota. Is that accurate? Uh, to, to some point. A lot of these uh, jobs are specialty jobs that uh, West, Virginia can, West Virginians cannot fill yet because the uh, gas industry, you know, for acting is rather new, uh, but the, with the community colleges and uh, colleges getting on board, you know, and training people for uh, pipeline inspectors and, uh, you know, safety people, and, and these jobs will start going more and more to uh, West Virginians, I believe. The reason is a lot of them are not West Virginia jobs now is because we don't have the qualified workforce, but we are filling that gap with our community colleges and, and technical uh, colleges to uh, to do this so uh, you know and, and a lot of the uh, uh, construction jobs will be West Virginians you know what I mean uh, it'll be companies in West Virginia with the excavating you know with the pipeline there'll be a lot of West Virginia uh, hired for the uh, pipeline installation so yeah it's going to, it's going to create West Virginia jobs but right now uh, you know we're just getting our workforce trained for a lot of these jobs so let's talk about the co-tenancy bill, and that was in your committee earlier today, and it yeah, passed, passed out, out of the committee. Yeah. Now there have been a few concerns mentioned, and um, in the past they've mentioned that it values corporations over people. What what would your response to that well, be? They say that about every bill, you know. Frankly, uh, you know, it, it's it's not about the corporation because your landowners and mineral owners are the one that owns these minerals in in the state. And, 
the most of them. You know, I mean, the corporations are buying them. They buy the mineral rights. But our uh, property owners here in West Virginia, you know, this is, you know, there's uh, people in uh, the northern panhandle up there, you know, are getting, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a month royalty checks off of, of gas, you know, we've been told. So, and that, that's West Virginia's people getting getting the money and spending it in the West Virginia economy. So that's another aspect of that. And the um, co-tenancy bill, it's basically a, a majority rules bill, uh, is a piece that uh, that the, the gas company needs to to develop, I mean, to make it easier for them to develop. You know, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of false information goes one with the uh, co-tenancy bill, you know, they call it the forced pooling, and it's not forced pooling. Uh, we're not talking about three or four tracks of land or five tracks of land and, and forcing them into that. We're talking one track of land that might have uh, 30, 40 heirs, and they can't reach all the heirs, or, you know, they might, know, they might be able to reach them, but 25, and this bill here, uh, most states go with the majority rules, 51%. This bill here, so they have to have 75%. So it's the best, and we're the only state in the country, if this passes, that has the, that kind of protection for property or mineral owners. Now, I know environmentalists have testified in the public hearing earlier this month and have told us that they're experiencing an overarching sense that everything is being fast-tracked and that there are long-term consequences that go along with rushing things through. They point to the Regulatory Reform Act, now under consideration, which they say expedites the permitting process. Well, you know, that's false. Uh, uh, you know, I've been around the Capitol. I was in the House of Delegates for four years, and the gas bills was always an issue that we tried to get them passed. Uh, the one, I can't remember the House bill now that uh, failed on last night with a 49 to 49 vote. That was three years ago. Last year, we had a gas bill passed out of the Senate and went to the House. So basically this is, you know, just another attempt at it. You know, it's been going on for at least, uh, this is my sixth year here, and it's been going on for at least six years trying to get some kind of legislation passed to, you know, improve the, the the business climate for with drilling for gas and you know to get uh, the, you know, the farm bureaus on board with this uh, the mineral owners associations on board with this you know i mean this all the stakeholders we finally got something that all the stakeholders there uh, has agreed on and uh, you know with the environmentalists uh, you know they're against all drilling all coal or all mining or whatever so you know it's not really fair to you know for them say that we're fast tracking this because this has been going on a long time, trying to come up with a, a solution. And I, I believe we finally came up with a solution that all the stakeholders and companies, you know, the, the gas companies don't like this bill 100%, but neither does, you know, and the landowners has got some, but they've came to a, a agreement that they can all agree on. So that's huge. Now let's switch gears and focus on Senate Bill 626, and that's known as the coal bill in this session. And this was on amendment stage today. It was advanced to third reading and up for vote tomorrow, of course. There are entire sections of the Water Pollution Control Act that are deleted in this bill. Can that legally be done, and why would that be yeah, necessary a lot or of advantageous? It, a lot of it is um, language that is in another uh, you know, statue someplace else in the law or whatever. It's more or less uh, compressing and uh, modernizing the law. You know, the only, uh, the DEP was in on the neg negotiation of this. They signed off on this. Co the West Virginia Coal Association was involved in this. Uh, the, uh, the only amendment that I've heard uh, from the environmental side was the uh, the posting where they, it has to be posted in the paper now, and in this bill, it, turn, it lets it be po uh, posted electronically, and that was the amendment that was going to that was uh, I've heard was going to be offered today, and it was never offered. You know, once it gets to the House side, maybe it is, but as far as the envir environmental issues, I haven't heard any complaints from anybody with the environmental issues. And like I said, the DEP signed off on this and you know it was changes that uh, they agreed with to kind of modernize and you know it doesn't change water quality uh, act or you know standards or anything like that it, it, it does not affect that at all and I, I'm proud that all the stakeholders involved was in agreement with the coal bill you know the UMWA United Mine Workers uh, DEP West Virginia Office of Mine Health and Safety Training so 
And, uh, well, Senator Smith, thank you so much for being here tonight. Right, Again, we had Senator here. Randy Smith, who is the chair of the Energy, Industry, and Mining Committee. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And now I look at the West Virginia Energy Jobs Rally held at the Capitol earlier today. I'm Scott Rotrock, Spielman Thomas in Battle. And I just think it's so important that you all came down here today. It's important to be here assembled so the industry can be seen. It's not like just going to one manufacturing site. You're spread out all over the state. We really appreciate that. I'm Judy Margolin. I think having so many people here from so many parts of our state demonstrates the importance of the energy industry statewide, not to just one region. It creates jobs directly in the energy industry and then, for example, I work at a law firm and it creates a lot of jobs for our firm as well. My name is Mark Montalione. I work for Bowles Rice. I'm the president of the Oil and Gas Association. We have an industry that can potentially boom, great jobs, long paying jobs, careers, help our future generations, help the kids from quitting going to other states to look for jobs. We would like to see a co tenancy bill that allows us to go drill on tracks where one person might be a holdout. We would like to see some tax reform in terms of property tax and severance tax, but we understand that the budget's tight and we're willing to wait for those things to happen when the time's right. Let me just first of all say how much we appreciate all the hard work you do in our state, throughout our state. Uh, we understand and, and recognize very strongly. As we're discussing this energy. evening, several energy related bills are making their way through the legislative process in this session, and several are raising significant concerns among environmentalists. Joining us now is Angie Rosser, Executive Director of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. Angie, thank you for joining us Thanks this evening. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you. So, Angie, you describe yourself and your organization as supportive of jobs and supportive of people, the health of people, and the health of our state, specifically with the co-tenancy bill, as we discussed earlier. You say on the surface it's about owner's rights, which you're all about, but it's also about increased productivity and massive build-outs of pipelines. Right. So it's putting the co a bill like co-tenancy in the bigger context, thinking about what we're here seeing with um, more pipelines, more compressor stations, uh, Appalachian storage hub, $84 billion in money coming from China. It just, when you put it all together, it's talking about more drilling, um, more chemicals introduced into our environment, um, more waste, toxic waste that we're going to have to manage. And as this development rapidly increases, it's also having a bigger footprint across West Virginia. So we're seeing more well pads, um, more impoundments located closer to homes, closer to schools, closer to uh, source water protection areas where we need to protect for our drinking water safety. So it's just, it's a rapid expansion. And I think the, the sentiment or the concern is, is are we really ready for it? And are we spending the time we should be thinking about environmental and public health concerns as we are thinking about how to grow the industry uh, very quickly? Now, what is your reaction to Senator Smith's comments about the Regulatory Reform Act now under consideration regarding the expediting of the permitting process and his position on the provided public input policies? Right, so that the Regulatory Reform Act is moving through the House. So in all fairness, maybe he hasn't seen the latest version, but it clearly is intended to expedite the permitting process for certain projects that the development office deems worthy. And in terms of public transparency, all of that decision making is, is couched in the development office to decide which projects will get this favor of an expedited process and which won't. And the public won't know about uh, which projects qualify or are selected until after the decisions are made. Now, environmentalists and conservationists such as yourself had said, expressed the fear of development being fast-tracked and that there are long-term consequences that go along with rushing things through. Right, and it goes back to what we're seeing here is that there's a lot of attention from the administration, from the legislature, on how do we help industry to grow. Well, at the same time, it's, we would like to see equal time devoted to making sure with, with this growth that we are protecting our people and protecting our, our, our water and land. And an example I have of, of where we feel like the legislature is falling short is that in 2011, we passed the Horizontal Well Control Act. In that, we're mandated studies to look at what does this development mean 
for people's health, um, including exposure to noise, uh, dust, uh, air, light pollution, um, the risk to water. Those studies were completed and available in 2013, but still five years later, the legislature has not acted on those recommendations to protect public health. So what, what other reactions have you heard among legislators about environmental concerns with these various bills that are running through? You know, it's, it's a really difficult space to talk about environmental protection because they hear environmental regulation as an impediment to industry growth. When we're saying, you know, we can have both, we just need to look at both at the same time. Um, you know, I, I think the overall attitude we're seeing with a, a moratorium from the governor on no more regulations, no more rulemaking, we're seeing this Regulatory Reform Act, um, we're seeing just an overall attitude about less regulation means more jobs, but we're not also talking about it, less regulation means more vulner vulnerability to our water, land, and our people. Now, and it's been your opinion that the DEP pretty much has tunnel vision. Can you elaborate on that? Well, um, I think there's a lot, at, not just at the DEP, but also legislator and the, the leadership we have here, is let's look at what we can make happen quickly and what those short-term needs we have to revive the economy, to recover from a coal decline, without really thinking about the long-term consequences. So when I think tunnel vision, it's also short-term vision. Um, we're looking at economic growth, but then not the long-term consequences of what economic price there may be to pay if we move too hastily or carelessly on, on these kind of projects. Now, we just talked to Senator Smith about the coal bill, which was advanced to third reading today. I uh, know that you're focused on the degrading of water quality standards on both Senate Bill 290 and Senate Bill 626, which is the coal bill That's, that you say serves industry and not citizens. Can you elaborate on some of your concerns with these two bills? Well, the coal bill has been really difficult because it, it, it's a different process. It was originated in, in the uh, Senate, Senate Energy Industry and Mining Committee. So it didn't actually become publicly available until Monday night, just this week, and it's being voted on tomorrow. So it gives the public very limited time to do our own analysis and educate the public, educate lawmakers, weigh in on what the implications of striking a whole section of the Water Pollution Control Act would be. Um, and you know, this was a, a bill that was brought forth uh, by the Coal Association and um, you know they're looking into how it benefits their industry and we're just not getting equal time or opportunity with the way this process has been fast-tracked to be able to to weigh in and and really contemplate and look at, at some of the very highly technical aspects of the bill that they'll be voting on tomorrow and there was also some public notice concerns as well that's right. They're making a fundamental change in how public notice of mining permits will be made. Instead of publishing those in paper, in the newspapers, they're more reliant on electronic means, which, you know, may be a good direction to head, but because not every citizen of this state has access to broadband internet connections, we're not ready for that. So until we get people access to be able to access that online notice, those local, pub those local publications in those small papers, especially in rural communities where coal um, activity is happening most, is, is still essential. Now, you've also been following Senate Bill 270, and that's the logging and bill in state parks. What's the coalition's perspective on this, and is it pretty much dead at this point? Because we have crossover day on Monday. That's right. It's coming down to the wire here. Um, and I was encouraged this week when I heard from a senator that he has gotten more calls and letters and contacts in opposition to the state park logging bill than any other bill this session. So to me, that was an indication that this thing is dying. <laughs> I mean, the, the public um, outcry about starting to log in state parks that people, you know, identify. I, Do we I need should to? say that that's the Senate <laughs> bill, meaning that they're coming into session right now. So that's the noise that we were hearing that's just it. now. <laughs> that's right. Um, but that's kind of what is happening in the public about this um, logging bill is the alarms are going off for people. There, you know, there are other places where logging occurs on state lands, but when people 
said they wanted to start it in state parks, it was like, no, hands off our state parks. Well, what's your message to the legislature as far as some of these bills going through? Well, um, you know, what's interesting is there's resistance to more regulation and rulemaking, but the bills they're passing this session are going to require rulemaking. So the d discussion isn't over. There are a lot of details to be worked out, um, and that will come before the legislature again, but we're definitely heading in a direction um, of rolling back environmental protections, which I think has a lot of people in this state concerned. Well, we thank you so much for your perspective. Again, we have Angie Rosser with the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. Thanks, Andrea. This concludes tonight's broadcast. Join us tomorrow evening for an update on the work stoppage, which is scheduled tomorrow and Friday, and the status of many other bills that are going through the legislative process. That's tomorrow night at 6 on the Legislature Today. I'm Andrea Lanham. Thanks for joining us, and have a great evening.